So last week we were looking at worry, and that's a, a big topic. A lot, a lot of us, it seems, I don't know how it was in the past, but I know today in our culture we experience anxiety and panic and we worry about so many things. We worry about not only things in the future that you've heard before that most of the things we worry about never happen. We also worry about things in the past, which is interesting because you, you ain't going to do anything about that. We cannot change what happens in the past. Anxiety, all sorts of mental and emotional distress, depression we talked about last week and how powerful that is. And we saw that Christ's mind and Christ's thought process, the way we cope, the way we deal with these things is twofold. One, we lean in close to God. And you'll notice that Satan is a deceiver. Our own flesh is in rebellion with God. And so you'll notice when you're going through depression, anxiety, fear of all sorts, your tendency is to be upset with God or say, no, 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 or I can't deal with God right now, I can't be at church. The very thing we should not do. Well, that's a deception. That's not the Holy Spirit who's telling you, you're too sad, you're too angry, you're too upset, you're too emotional. Don't go to church. That is not the Holy Spirit. It's a lie from the enemy, or, or it could be coming from our flesh. Either way, it's a, it's a deception. So Christ gave us a twofold pattern here. One, lean in close to God. And secondly, put his kingdom first. Put God first in everything. Uh, care for others. Putting God's kingdom first means caring for others. Love God, right, is the pattern, and then love others. When we're full of love for God and we're full of love for others, the neat thing about that is there isn't room to be full of things like worry or greed or all that other stuff. This is God's arithmetic. Chase after the concerns of this world. I got to get, I got to get, I got to get. And the Bible tells us it's like trying to grasp the wind or catching oil in your hands. I got to get, you got your hands like this all the time. You open up, you got nothing. God's arithmetic. However, when we go before the Lord like that, he fills us with all good things. Put God in his kingdom first and gain all things. This is a message that's contrary to the flesh, contrary to the world. And so this makes a message very difficult. Uh, and again and again we see this. Jesus is not convenient. Jesus is challenging us all the time. The Holy Spirit is there convicting us all the time. And yes, God is scary. God's scary. He's not here to keep us in our comfort zone. He's here to draw us close to him, away from the way we grew up, the way from the way our culture thinks, away from the things that we are naturally inclined to do are usually wrong. I got to get, I got to get, I got to watch out for myself. Nobody's going to say that to me. All those things, those knee-jerk reactions, those brain cramps are almost always in almost every situation wrong and God is calling us to something very very radical very very different in faith is saying okay God I want to follow you there take me out of myself now I'm not saying you, we lose our personality I'm saying with this wickedness selfishness right God take me out of this Lord selfishness ruins my relationships with everybody around me. Selfishness makes me full of anxiety. Selfishness makes me depressed. Selfishness, uh, it, Lord, I'm always ticked off at you and with everybody else. There's no peace in selfishness. The Apostle Paul put it this way, God's arithmetic. Godliness plus contentment equals great gain. This is the economy of heaven. This is how we have great gain. <laughs> Godliness, holiness, striving after things of God, and contentment, thankfulness in our hearts, appreciation in our hearts. When we're full of thankfulness, we're not full of bitterness. And the world and our flesh is trying to take us out of this living relationship with God all the time. Now, when we're alive, when we, become, uh, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we get the Holy Spirit, right? Right? But the Bible says, now that you're alive by the Spirit, now therefore walk by the Spirit. It's possible to have the Holy Spirit, but not to be in tune, not listening. I mean, we all know it's possible because we're all there too often. But the Bible 
church, Bible studies, fellowship, all this is supposed to be constantly pulling us back to God's way of thinking because if we're not thinking God's way from the perspective of heaven and the heavenly angels and looking down at we're all crazy, foolish. I'm going to get this, I'm going to get that, and bent out of shape and upset and angry. And what does that do for us? It's crazy. It's silly. Well, like we said last week, you know, for crazy too, there's grace for that. There's grace for that. Jesus Christ's death on the cross paid for it all. And it's grace that allows us, instead of having to fight with it and argue with it and deny it and cover it, we can just say, God, here I am. I need your grace. I need your love. And we move in close to God once again. And he says, now here's what I want you to do. I want you to love everyone around you. I want you to care for them. I want you to think of them. I want you to desire good for them. Get out of yourself. That's a dead end. Now the flow of chapter 12 in Luke, and you can turn it there if, if you haven't already. The flow of chapter 12 in Luke is very interesting. And I said last week, sometimes we're reading these stories and we think, there's just a story here, and now he's going to talk about rich people, and now he's going to talk about worry, and now he's going to talk about sharing your faith. We, we talk about them as if they're, they're all different ideas, but the way they're tied together here is very interesting. Jesus hits on several different themes that, again, at first glance, at first glance they seem unrelated, but when you take a step back, then you can see it all together. You can see the whole narrative. Luke chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. The teaching here is be genuine. Christian, be genuine. Don't be like the hypocritical Pharisees. Putting on a show for other people does not equal real faith. See, that, that was another God's arithmetic thing. Does not equal. Putting on a show for other people does not equal real faith. Uh, Jerry was teaching about uh, evangelism this morning. Did a great job with that. And he said something that I liked. He said, a cheesy presentation of the gospel is okay. <laughs> Just do something. I'll tell you what. You can stumble over your words and it'll be okay. It can be cheesy as heck and that's okay. What's, those are forgivable. What's not forgivable is if we're not genuine, if we're not earnest. And you know what? Even the unsaved can see the difference. If you're cheesy, but you're earnest, that might open you a slight hearing. You know, they might listen to what you have to say. But if they think, this person's a hypocrite, this person's a fake, I don't even really think they believe, or all, I'm in, I, all I am is a checklist that they want to check off that they evangelized today. If they don't feel any concern for them, well, that doesn't work. Be genuine. Christ is calling his children into a real faith, not a hypocritical Make believe, put on show. Verses 4 through 7, fear God. I said God is scary. If you, know, if you don't know him, or if you don't know him very well, you will not fear God. You understand the living God, and we understand what it means to fear the living God. Jesus said, don't worry about people. We worry so much about people who don't have their act together, what they'll think about us. They don't have their act together. And yet we're so concerned, what are they going to think of me? If, I, if, I, if they know that I'm friends with the living God, the creator of the universe, what will they think of me? Uh, people who are spiritually dead, going into eternity without God, this is hell, need your love. They need you to love them more than you love your own comfort zone. But here's what you have to understand. Their opinion on spiritual matters should not matter to you. That's what being spiritually dead is. Their, their, their opinion on spiritual matters should not matter to you. Rather than fearing the lost, fear the living God. The worst they can do, and here Jesus, is, here Jesus does this Jesus thing that's so scary. He said, what can they do to you? They can kill you. And Jesus in his, you know, Divine economy, the heavenly ma mathematics, that ain't nothing. <laughs> Rather, fear the one who could toss you into eternity uh, in hell. Verse 8 through 10, 
Be bold to acknowledge God publicly. Don't keep your faith a secret. Why do you think Jesus is talking like this? Well, all this progression here. Well, this is one of the things we worry about, isn't it? Because we're weak. We're, we can be cowardly. Lord, we need your strength. We need your courage. We need your wisdom. We need, what we need is love, right? <laughs> no love, you keep your mouth shy, sh- silent. More love, you can't help. You love God, you can't help but talk about God. You love other people, you really want to share with them the message of Jesus Christ. We want to love people so much that it breaks our heart to see them go into eternity without Christ. And that's what it means to be more Christ-like. Verses 11 and 12. Don't even worry about what you'll say if you are made to report in front of the authorities. What if the school board wants to talk to you or, 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 or the police or, or some local government officials or somebody else? Don't worry when you're made to report to the authorities. The Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what to say. And again, if you are speaking earnestly, honestly from your heart, The skillfulness of your presentation, how cheesy it is, does not matter. You talk from your heart about your relationship with the living God. The Holy Spirit can use that. Verses 13 and 15, more of God's arithmetic. Life is greater than the sum of our possessions. You know the greater sign? Or for you guys, maybe it's this way. I don't know. What are you guys seeing? Anyways. But I have to look at it. I have to practice in front of a mirror, maybe. Hey, that's the sign of the cross almost. Okay. First time I did that in here. Uh, verses 16 through 21, prosperity minus God equals nothing. We all believe that up here. Let's start to believe it here too. I could get everything. Prosperity minus God equals nothing. Verses 22 through 23, real life is more than food and clothes. 24 through 26, our lives plus worry Add nothing. And Jesus was almost laughing about this. And here's a funny thing also about your translation. Some of you might say add an inch to your height, and some may say add an hour to your life. It's because the word there is cubit, which actually meant from your elbow. It's talking about a ruler, but, but it's hard to know what he's talking about, whether he's talking about adding a cubit length to your life or adding a cubit length to your height. So either way, Jesus said, you know, living longer, adding some extra height, that's easy for guys like me. God's saying, you know, he's God, right? That's easy, but you can't even do that. So why are you worried about all of these other things? Our lives plus worry add nothing. Worry, how's that working out for you? Well, it's not. Worry is a cruel master. I want a good master. Uh, I want to fear only God. I'm not there, but I want to fear God with my life because I don't want to be living in fear of all of these other things Christ is talking about because those are cruel, miserable masters that treat us badly. They make us uh, miserable slaves. 32 through 34, uh, jump back, 27 through 31, again, put God in his kingdom first and gain what really matters. 32 through 34, trust God and care for others because where your treasure is, your heart will be also. And you can know what a person loves by checking their credit card account or their bank account, their, their uh, checkbook. So the antidote to hypocrisy, fear, greed, worry, and a dead faith is loving God and actually getting out of ourselves and seeking to be a blessing to other people. Loving God, no longer being full of ourselves because now we're full of love for God and caring wanting to be a blessing to other people. Isn't that a good way to live? Wouldn't you rather be a blessing than a curse to those around you? Now, let's see where Christ goes next. And it's going to be difficult again and again. It's going to be surprising, uh, countercultural, unexpected. Jesus continues with the heavenly mathematics, and he adds two more thoughts. One, listen to this. It's going to surprise you if you haven't studied this before. God divides. God splits. God breaks apart. Well, isn't God all about bringing people together? Yes, we come together through Jesus Christ. But as soon as Jesus Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. As soon as he says that, what does it do? It's dividing between those who come to Christ and those who fight against Christ. Two, 
The equation of this life only makes sense, and it was funny because Jerry used almost these exact same words this morning in Sunday school class, only makes sense in light of eternity. Only makes sense when we factor in eternity. Living for God in the here and now only makes sense if we live in the wake of God's future. Like the future's already out there, we gotta be living in his, in his wake. It's like Jesus is watching you do your homework. Got your crayon, you're scribbling there, and he's looking over your shoulder, and as you say, look, denying myself what I want, caring about others, equals less time for myself, maybe less comfort, less money for myself. He's watching you do your homework. He puts his hand on your shoulder and says, Jesus smiles, he says, uh, but you forgot to factor in eternity. Trust me, it makes sense then. See, this is faith. This is faith to be able to trust God with the eternal equation. See, when you get to the root of it, Jesus is a radical. More mathematical humor. But seriously, when you get to the root of it, see, Jesus is a radical. Nope. Seriously, uh, Jesus is a radical, and he does not conform to society's expectations. If you want to fit in, you can't follow Christ. He said, follow me. He was a pariah. Become more like Christ. You're going to stand out. Jesus said, don't hide your light under a bushel. Let it shine. You're supposed to be like a city on a hill. People should look to you if they want to get close to God. They should see so much Jesus in your life that they see you're different. And if they don't, you're doing it wrong. Jesus is radical. He's not going to change things a little bit. He doesn't want to rock the boat. He's going to sink the boat. Okay, from chapter 12, 35 through 40. Keep a weather eye to the sky. Where does Christ go next with this whole sermon? Be dressed and ready for service. Uh, the idea is here is gird your loins. Gird your loins, which is like a servant who's ready to do his master's work, or like the, the Jews when they were ready to, to leave Egypt in Exodus, when they're eating their Passover, they're supposed to have their staff there, and they're supposed to be, their loins are girded, meaning they're ready for action, they're ready to move out. Christian, follower of God, if you want to be a follower of God, be dressed and ready for service, and keep your lamps burning like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet. And I was reading some of the old timers, and they made a big deal out of this. And I think it's, it's, it's neat. They said, where is Jesus coming back from? A party, because he dwells in heavenly banquets and parties. I, I don't know if that was the point here, but I like it. Where is Jesus coming back from when he comes to get us? He's coming from perpetual paradise. He's coming from a wonderful place. Be ready for your master He's coming back from a good time. So when he comes and knocks, they can, the servants can immediately open up the door for them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Listen to this. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve. He's going to put on servants' clothes. We'll have them recline at the table and will come and wait on them. What? Didn't, you, didn't that kind of surprise you? Who would write this? If this is not from the heart of God, God, mighty God, is going to come and he's going to put on clothes of a servant. You know what? That's what Jesus did when he died for us on the cross. And this is his idea of love, serving and loving and taking care of one another. And he leads the example. It would be good for those servants who master finds them ready even when he comes in the middle of the night or towards daybreak, second or third watch. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let uh, his house be broken into. You must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. He's going to come at a time when you do not accept, expect him. So keep a weather eye to the sky. So Jesus now is talking end times. Isn't that an interesting thing? He takes this whole topic of worry, concern, greed, living for yourself, 
and he's transitioning right into the end times because we need to understand the future in order for our here and now living for Christ to make sense. And I didn't see that before because I would read each story separately instead of all together. Verse 37 here, when it says he will come and serve, and how is this in the Bible? What is God is going to come and serve? It reminded me when we studied Hosea chapter 2, verse 16, just a couple weeks ago, in that day declares the Lord. In that day declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. You will no longer call me my master. I don't know what God's doing. I want to see how that works out. The Didache, it's an ancient, ancient manuscript, discovered, you know it was only discovered in 1883? For most of the last 2,000 years, Christianity, we didn't have the Didache. The Didache is this ancient, ancient book that was written before the New Testament was finished. Isn't that cool? It's a Christian book written before the New Testament was finished. It was written while the apostles were still alive. The full name is the teaching of the apostles. And there are many modern scholars who think it's very possible that it was written by the apostles. But God, in his wisdom, chose for it not to be part of Scripture. And, and I'm agreeing with God on this one. When I, when I go back and read it, there's some little funny parts in it. It's been called the most important book you've never heard of unless you come to our church because then we mention it quite frequently. Listen to this, the Didache. It's a lovely book. I love it. The opening lines, the, the Didache opens with this. There are two ways, one of life and one of death, and there is a great difference between the two. The first way of life is this. First, you shall love God who made you, and second, love your brother as yourself, and do not do to another what you do not want them to do to you. The meaning of these sayings is this. Bless those who curse you. Pray for your enemies. Now remember, this is written probably before all the Gospels were finished. This is ancient Christianity, not Bible. It's not in our Bible. And yet this is the ancient Christians, how they were thinking and talking. In, in fast, go, go on a fast for those who persecute you. For what reward is there in loving those who love you? Do not the heathens do the same? But you should love those who hate you, and then you shall have no enemies. In light of the anniversary of Roe versus Wade, I thought chapter 2, verse 2 is important. Listen to this. General teachings to Christians. Do not commit murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not corrupt young boys. Do not have illicit sex. Do not steal. Do not practice magic. Do not practice witchcraft. You shall not murder a child, whether it is born or unborn. Do not covet the things of your neighbor. And I, I often hear people who don't understand history say that, uh, modern evangelicals are just anti-abortion, but that's really not a part of Christianity. It is. It's historically been part of the medieval church to the modern church. And right here, the very first generation of Christians before the Bible has even been written, it said, don't murder a child, whether it's born or unborn. This idea in the sanctity of life is key to Christianity from the very beginning. Let God be the one who decides who lives and dies. That's not our pay grade. Uh, jump ahead then in the Didache to, to chapter 16, verse 1. Watch over your life that your lamps are never quenched and that your loins are never unloosened. Be ready, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Uh, come, come together often, seeking the things that are good for your souls. Isn't that beautiful? For obviously, he's either quoting, the, they're either quoting for Luke or teaching a teaching that also Luke also writes down. But then come together often, dear Christian followers of Christ, come together often seeking the things that are good for your souls. Isn't it good to be here? And isn't it good for our souls that we recenter ourselves and refocus ourselves through the Bible studies and our personal prayer time and reading the Bible and coming to church, being around Christian people? It's good for our souls, isn't it? It's wonderful. And again, Christ culminates the teaching of chapter 12 by telling us to live in light of the second coming. 1 John 3.3, 3, everyone who has this hope on him purifies himself just as he is pure. In Titus 2.12-14, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires to, to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us 
from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Uh, are we passionate about doing the things of God? Are we zealous uh, to share our faith, to bless others? Verse 41 uh, is interesting. It's interesting because Luke decides to put it in our Bibles. Look at verse 41. So, so Jesus is saying, the Son of Man is going to come in an hour when you do not expect him. And they're in this crowd, and the apostles are there, and Peter says, uh, Lord, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? That's just so neat. The Bible is full of those kinds of things that you wouldn't expect to be in there. It's interesting that Luke put, decides to put it in our Bibles at all. Millions of people for the last 2,000 years have read this question in a huge variety of cultures and languages. Peter asks, Lord, are you telling us this parable to us or to everyone? And Jesus doesn't answer him directly. Instead, he jumps into another story, which is just like my Jesus, right? So typical of Jesus. This time, the next story, Jesus goes after the religious teachers, and especially these false teachers that do more harm than good. And his words are absolutely terrifying. They're frightening. Look at verse 46. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and that hour that he's not aware of it, he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. Because this so-called servant, this teacher, did not take care of the flock, he wasn't a true believer himself. And the Bible warns us that in the end days, the last days, there will be many people parading as religious leaders that are false teachers. You can't just pick up any book, turn on the radio or the television, and just say, feed me, and leave your Bibles closed and your mind open like a sewer. Right. You have to be thinking. You have to be aware. And Jesus says, these false teachers, I mean, the language is horrific. The language is much w worse than, than, uh, than Jewish culture would have expected. That's, this is barbaric. But the master is going to come back and kill his servant. He's going to cut him up. And worse yet, he's excluded from the people of God for eternity. All right, read 49 through 53. And again, brothers and sisters, this is a Jesus that the world doesn't know. This is a Jesus who says scary things. This is a Jesus who means business. In the entire Old Testament, you know, we always say the Old Testament is so scary. The Old Testament only talks about hell in glimpses. It only foreshadows. It only talks about it a little bit. Most of the New Testament doesn't talk much about hell. It talks about how we can have faith in God here and now. Do you know who talks about divine punishment in hell the most in the entire Bible? It's Jesus, the one the world wants to keep as a cute little cuddly baby. They don't want to meet the, the mighty Savior who boldly came and laid down his life for those he loves and is coming back and there will be division between those who believe and those who do not believe. Verse 49. And this is going to include an Old Testament quote from the book of Micah, where Michael says, trust God. You can't even trust the woman lying in your arms, but trust God. Put him first and foremost in all things. So 49 through 53. Jesus says, the warm, cuddly Jesus, right? The, the precious moments Jesus. I have come to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. We're going to put that on our marquee out front. <laughs> I have come to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo. He's talking about the baptism of his death on the cross. There's something I have to undergo. There's something I have to do before this fire is unleashed. And what constraint I am under, or what anxiety I am under, your translation may say, until it is completed. It weighed heavily on him. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on, there will be five and one family divided against each other, three against two and two against three. They will be divided father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. <coughs> I want us to take time and pause to think about this. Jesus is 
planning, he says, I, I long to kindle a fire. He wants to start a fire that's going to burn away false religion, going to burn away the self-deception, the things we tell ourselves that just aren't true. And he wants to start a fire for the gospel, a fire of passion that's going to consume our hearts, is going to burn away all the things in our hearts that don't belong. And this fire that he started in Jerusalem has spread like a wildfire across the planet. This is why Christ came. He says, I need to start this fire. I need to, to change things, to burn things up so something new can come. Burning away all the false, bringing the true and the real. And guess what? The kindling was his own body. This is how seriously that he wanted to bring the fire of the gospel that would burn across the entire globe. He was going to lay down his own life. Why would Jesus do this? We can't go to heaven without the blood of Jesus Christ. Sisters, brothers, we're messed up inside. We are sinners. We fight with God all the time. We make excuses. We run from the light because it's too bright. Sometimes it's easier to leave in, live in self-deception than to come close to Jesus and see all the mess I have to fix, all the mess that's wrong inside. Jesus Christ loves you. At your worst, most miserable, pathetic point that you don't want anybody to see because you feel if people saw me at my worst, they wouldn't put up with me. They wouldn't love me. Jesus sees you at your worst, and he still wants you. He wants you at your worst. When he sees you as, at your worst, he says, I'll die for that one. I want you in my family. Lord, you don't want me. I want you. And I'm going to make something beautiful out of your life. And everybody is going to see that I am the true and living God when they see you become one of mine. Jesus Christ wants to start this fire. He wants to start this fire in our families, in our church, in our lives. Don't fight the Holy Spirit. Let God rule in our lives. And then guess what? We want to let this fire burst out of our families and start spreading around our neighborhood and our workplace and our schools. And everywhere we go, the fire of the Holy Spirit is kindled. This is Christ's plan. He said, how I yearn to start this, but first I've got to die. First, I've got to die and pay for people's sins. Brothers and sisters, you want to be a part of what God's doing? We have to die to ourselves. We have to say yes to God, and we need to get out there and start sharing the love of God with everybody we can. And there is nothing, nothing at all that could be more important than this. Don't be like the rich man who built all those barns, and then he died, and what did that? He didn't take his toys with him to heaven. That didn't matter. Live for God. Put him first in all things. All right, let's finish up now with verse 54 to the end of the chapter. Interpreting the times. Be aware of the end times. He said to the crowd, when you see a cloud, cloud, when he said to the crowd, when you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say, it's going to rain. And it does. When the south wind blows, you say, it's going to be hot. And it is. Hypocrites. It's. Hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky. How is it that you don't know how to interpret this present time? Jesus Christ coming as a fulfillment this time of so many prophecies. God, love incarnate standing before them, and so many rejecting, so many not seeing. Why don't you judge for yourselves what is right? He said, think for yourselves, what's a good idea here? What makes sense to you? As you are going with your adversary to the magistrate, try hard to be reconciled on the way, or your adversary may drag you off to the judge, and the judge turn you over to the officer, and the officer throw you into prison. I tell you, you will not get out. You have paid the very last penny. Jesus ends this whole section, this powerful section, that looks like it's just about uh, fear, just about greed, just uh, all these different things, of sharing our faith. He ties it all together, and he ends with a powerful call to repentance. He warns us, get right with God before it's too late. Don't wait before you stand before the judge. Right now on this journey of life, make your peace with the judge now. Get reconciled to God right now. Judge for yourself what makes sense, Christ said. 
You want to pay the penalty of your sins? You're never getting out. You can't pay, pay every last penny. How can you earn any money when you're sitting in jail? But Christ paid for it all with his blood on the cross. That's why he said, I yearn to start this fire, but first I have to go undergo my baptism. And now on your way to eternity, Christ with his powerful message says, get right, make it right, get right with the Lord rather than pay the penalty yourself. Be reconciled to the living God. And I think it's kind of neat to hear a come to Jesus message from Jesus. I want to end with another quote from the Dedicate. Let grace come and let this world pass away. Amen. Thank you for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.